Hey, my name's Bruce Snell. I'm with BSG International, and today we're going over in part four, which is focusing on uh, personal and preventive and corrective actions. We're going to be uh, on class 14, and that is uh, team individual task team. Now, uh, in our last class before, we kind of started getting some uh, initial brushes with brainstorming for problems and writing process step and writing procedure. This task team is a little more of a formal process that can be done, done inside, outside of a regularly scheduled either uh, team. So what this process that we're going over today is for a little more complex problems uh, in the organization, which gives us a little more support to, to manage and monitor the task teams. So today it is uh, a team, individual task teams, and it's in part four for corrective and preventive a uh, actions. If you look at uh, page one of our handout of our class today, it says uh, task team executive summary brainstorming and consensus agreement. You'll see some familiar things in here. Number one of how do we get started? And that is, is that there's the three step on a uh, brainstorming for a consensus agreement. This part is how do we get to uh, whatever we're going to be working on in a task team, and we'll talk a little more about that. Right now, let's look at step one. We're brainstorming. We're asking ourselves what are our problems in our base work center. Step two, problem selection. We multi-vote, and we'll ask which problem will the team work on and write a problem statement. Step three, cause and the effect. We're asking ourselves why. 98% of the time the answer is obvious to the group. List the answers on the flip chart with a problem statement. We now spin out to process B task team format. Keep asking why until we discover that root cause. So if you look at what's different from this class than the last one, the, really the uh, last class of what we're working on with brainstorming is really focusing on what we have to do as a team and as an individual to get these skills down to function both as an individual and as a team and you get some uh, introductory uh, work on process step and writing procedure. This task team uh, format here, and you heard us talk about task team in spinning out, this is really that what we call uh, process B, the task team format. It's a little more formalized, a little more in depth than what our last class was. The last class is good for some problems and uh, just introductory getting into problem solving. So this task team here is that the sponsoring of a task team as we get in an organization will eventually get as the base skills grow. Anybody internally within the organization can sponsor a task team. And what we're saying here, again, the task team needs to focus in its area of expertise and control. The task team needs to take issues that are a concern to the team and uh, to, or to their department and have a vehicle to go in and, and basically fix that uh, particular issue. If you look at the sponsoring of a task team, is that as the skills grow, anyone can go to what we usually in most companies have a coordinator that we get a task team number and we start on the task team. The training and implementation of the solution. If you look at it, as we talked before and throughout this thing, it's very important. A lot of times we go in and put a lot of energy and effort uh, into either what kind of half hardly brainstorming or trying to fix a problem, but we're not writing anything down or formalizing what we're doing. And one of the big things that suffer is the implementation. And usually almost all the time, even if we've done a good job, of even actually writing the procedure, because remember, most of us get into meetings, we talk about a lot of stuff, we go, okay, you don't do that, you don't do this, I won't do this, this is what we got to do from here on out, and that's about as far as an informal as it goes. What we're saying here is that we got to formalize that process, not only once we go through and define the answer or the solution to that particular task team that we're working on, but also we do a good implementation and training because, the, again, if we're not training on it, it, we might as well not even do the thing. Because remember how we usually get that information out is, is that we just send out a memo or we hand it out or we try not to schedule a formal meeting because it takes time, but we send somebody through the company to kind of visit everybody and then half the people get it and half don't. We end up spending about 25 
times the amount of time trying to fix it if we just do it right. In a lot of our organizations, the biggest thing, especially after the first two or three years, is getting and applying the discipline. This is so much discipline for us to do it right kind of the first time. And that is, if we're going through the effort, let's do it right. It only takes that much more time to formalize it and have, have a, a, good, uh, a good task team, a good problem statement, a good written procedure. So the training and implementation of the solution is very important. Today, as we talked about, we're going to be focusing on task teams, a little more formalized process. And hopefully, from our last class, we're going to, we went over kind of the what are our problems, which problem we work on, and why here just a second ago. But what we really want to do here is look at formalizing this task team process and step. But we also want to remember those things that we learned in our last class, how to participate in a team, how to multi-vote, and how to do all that stuff. So again, we, everything that we're doing kind of helps out with everything else. And so that's why it's all kind of in the base skills uh, 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 program. All right, let's look on page three that says task team process and step startup. What we're looking at here is how do we get started developing a task team? If you look at it, review the forms and form procedures to help uh, make the items uh, 1 through 13 below. Uh, if you look at that, it says sponsor, step number one. Okay, in order to get a task team, we have to have somebody sponsor the thing. And if you look at it, the task team sponsor, they complete items uh, 1 and 2 and 4 through 16 on a task team form. And we'll get to the task team form in a second. What this is, we're going to kind of go over the concept and the process formally. We're going to get into the form, and you'll be able to go back uh, after this class and even further train and study on how to uh, formalize this task team process. So the sponsor, remember, everybody in the organization and anybody should be able to sponsor a task team. When we go into companies, everybody and anybody can be a sponsor. They just have to coordinate it with the organization's either training coordinator or the coordinator or steering committee. And we're saying that the sponsor, number one, should be involved in that particular task team. What we don't want is somebody running through the company and going out there and sponsoring task teams, telling everybody what they need to do and not participating in it. And it's easier to point fingers at different departments and say, y'all need to fix this. So the sponsor not only is sponsoring the task team, but they need to be involved in the task team. And in that, they will also do their best to pick a team or uh, pick the task team uh, leader, which more than likely the sponsor and the task team leader are sometimes, the, and the majority of the time, the same person. So we're saying that if I'm now sponsoring task team, chances are I'm going to be the, the, uh, the task team leader of that. Then we want to look at what are these base work centers that are touching this particular problem that's getting us to form a task team. Now the task team can also be outside uh, of problem solving, meaning that we want to introduce a new product, a new service, a new software, or whatever it is, we can use this training, I'm, I'm sorry, this task team training here to also implement that because remember, it's a more of a formalized process. So the task team's not just focusing on problem solving, but it's how we want to formally address what I'm going to tell you, any issue internally within the organization. Because remember, we've got to formalize how we're doing business. And this process is that we have to formalize how we're doing these things. So if you look at the sponsor reviews the task team, I'm on step two, reviews the task team with the coordinator and our facilitator. And what we're looking at is that in most of the organizations where there's task teams, there's usually a task team or a coordinator or training coordinator. They're going to get that number and uh, a task team log number that they will log that the coordinator will be able uh, to manage and monitor the thing. The task team members, what the, the sponsor or, and the team leader will do is that they'll pick the task team members. Now remember, there's a, there's a lot of interesting things here. We're looking at, number one, 
a team best folk or functions with only four to seven team members. You start getting more than that, you can't agree on anything. So example, let's just say with everything we're talking about here today, that we've got 10 base work centers or 10 jobs that are affected by this task team. So let's say to make up this one system, there's 10 processes, which in a term we're saying are 10 base work centers. So what we're going to do as the sponsor and as the team leader, I am going to pick between four and seven of those base work centers. What we're asking is get the most crucial base work centers on this task team. And as that, those most crucial base work centers will formalize, basically moving this, uh, this thing to a solution, then we'll get the other base work centers to sign off on it. But right now, and we want to have that uh, base work center task team between four or seven four and seven team members. I prefer really around four because the other base work centers can also uh, function as what we call resource people, meaning they're not a part of the formal team, but we can bring them in as we need them. Example, that they're not a part of the task team, but we can say, okay, we need you to work on this procedure here. We can assign that out as an action item, but they're not a part of the team. Again, the reason we want to keep the team between four and seven, because it's easier to manage and easier to move through the process. And believe it or not, when we got adults in class even, uh, you start getting over seven, they start having their own conversations. And uh, I'm just kind of curious with, we got 35 school kids in one class, how, how they get them to pay attention. So if you look at it, four to seven is what we want to do and look at those members. And we also want to complete the items on the task team. We'll go over that when we get to the task team a little more in depth than what I'm doing here. But what we're asking is, is that as a sponsor, I'm coming in with a problem or problem statement and or a task. So what we're going to do is that we're going to start putting this team together we're going to start getting together, and then we're going to also want to agree on, or do we need to restate that problem statement? If you look at the problem statement is, is that the task team members are saying, hey, I agree, or I understand that problem statement, or we need to rewrite the problem statement, or whatever it is. So the team members are looking at, and I'm on step three there, Step three is, is that they're looking at, okay, can we agree on the problem statement? Do we need to clarify it? Next, let's set some meetings. Because what we want to do while we're in this is that the meetings, let's say it's going to take six weeks or three months or something like that. We want to set the meetings like a week out from the end to make sure we got enough time toward the end. And we want to schedule usually a meeting in between and half to at least have those agreed on while we're in that first meeting. And again, the reason for that is to where we can plan that to make sure everybody has enough advance notice to where they're going to participate in the team. The problem statement. We've talked about the problem statement now. That's item number or step number four. We are asking ourselves what is the real problem. We're saying separate the emotion from the issue and write a problem statement. A team can't fix what it hasn't identified well. Again, we're going to go over this problem statement because it's so key. Remember, a good, clear uh, problem statement will often uh, suggest the solution. So we want to make sure that uh, the, the, we're stating that problem or that task clearly enough to where the team understands it, narrowly enough to where we can accomplish it. Okay, number five is, is that cause and effect. Again, we're going to ask why, and it usually takes three to four whys before we get down to what the real answer is. And we're saying the cause and the effect, why is the problem happening? What did we say is the first thing we should be asking? We should be asking, number one, right out, right out of the blocks, is there a written procedure? If there's not a written procedure, What's our first step? Our first step is to write a procedure because if you don't, uh, chances the reason it is a problem because there's not a written procedure uh, on the thing and we can't even get started until we at least have something tangible that we can work on. 
So we're going to now look at number six, solution selection. Number five is we're going to ask why. Number six step, we're going to the solution selection, which problem or which solution will we work on or focus on, or let's agree on that. And that's where the consensus agreement also comes in, from either multi-voting to select it or to come to a consensus agreement, which we covered more in depth in the uh, brainstorming for problems. That's what we're saying. That's a lot more in that class was really focused on the skills around the table and the format of brainstorming and getting to this point of a task team. So these are good carryover skills. Uh, solution selection, we're now asking which solution will the team work on? And that's the, the multi-voting, I'm sorry, number six. Number seven, the goal of the first task team meeting. What is it that we're trying to do? The sponsor has now started the task team form, got a, hopefully now a team leader other than themselves. If they don't, uh, we would encourage the sponsor to also lead the team because they know why they're there. And then it says the goal of that first task team meeting, we kind of get everything. We get the, the, the number from the task team coordinator or the steering committee or the training department. Now we take off and we're starting to uh, complete some items for our first team meeting. Okay, 7.1 is complete items 15 through 18, and we'll look at those in a minute and go over that. 7.2, as the team uh, work to a consensus agreement, as a team work to consensus agreement on steps four through six, may take more than one meetings on four through six. Four through six is focusing on a lot of different issues in regards to what that problem is and writing process step and procedure, and we'll cover that in a little more. This here is just for reference when you go back. Assignment of the action items. Okay, the action items again are, is a formal document to make sure when we're in that meeting that everybody there is going to be held accountable and write down because I don't, how many of us have been to those meetings that we agree to do something, come back and, and none of the stuff's done. So that thing puts us behind about three gazillion times. And so what happens, we're wanting to formalize. It, it's not that we're trying to catch nobody doing nothing wrong, but this is a part of creating those good habits. Okay, on page number four is number eight, action items of the first task team meeting. At the end of the first meeting, use action item form to start drafting agreements. The task team could take as an example for the next task team meeting. Look at items 19 through 20. Okay, now let's look at what we're trying to accomplish in this task team. Remember the, the rules for almost everything that we're doing uh, in the entire program is getting the people in their area of expertise and control involved in fixing the problem, and they're the best ones to tell us how. So what we want to do is that as we pick this particular task that we're working on, these are some things we want to get the ball rolling because usually there's somebody in that task team, mainly the sponsor or someone else in those base work centers, that really know what we're talking about and they're good starts to start drafting up. 8.1, draft of a, a problem statement if needed. If the team is still trying to come to agreement on that problem statement, that's fine. Have a volunteer, because remember when we're in these team meetings, it's really kind of hard to get all the people to agree on anything, especially if we haven't gotten it uh, formalized yet. We're sitting here verbally or we're throwing it up on a flip chart. Man, we could sit there and beat that deal to death all day long. So first thing we want to do is try to get, see who's involved in what particular uh, issue that we're addressing. Then we want to start assigning out some actions of what we're talking about here uh, in eight. To, for them to go draft and bring back to the meetings or start getting it signed off. So when we come to the meetings, it's literally some decision making instead of trying to draft up and argue with five or ten different people. So 8.2 is draft a solution. Start to brainstorm for solutions. Draft of forms, paperwork, procedure forms, and our paperwork. Now remember, why do we talk about that? Remember, we're saying that the forms, the paperwork suggests systems and processes. That's why everything you'll ever see us do is always ask, what are those forms? What are those paperwork? Uh, what's that paperwork? What is that 
uh, computer screen that you're looking at or entering this data. And then it says draft a written procedure if there's no written procedure. Again, if we have a problem statement, we're saying, number one, if there's no written procedure for that problem statement, we need to write a procedure. This would be a good thing to start with. So it looks at we can draft a problem statement, then we can draft the solutions and start brainstorming for solutions. This task team, we can also work outside of that in little task teams or through the action items. That is, maybe get a couple of people together to start really brainstorming a solution. Then they can maybe draft that, whether it's process, whether it's step, whether it's procedure or whatever. But get everybody in the team involved and assign out different things. And then what we're looking at is that have someone collect the paper, have someone do the form summary, have somebody do the process and step, because we can't write procedure really until we have a process and step. And that's what you're going to see in these later classes of everything that we're talking about, how it starts coming together. And you're going to see almost everything that we're going to be doing is going to have process, step, and procedure. Because again, that's why a lot of the problems and issues that we have. Notes, it's a lot easier to get, a, uh, I'm still on number eight, it says notes, it's a lot easier to get a consensus agreement once something is written down for the team to modify, correct, or make a consensus agreement. The team would assign these out as action items. Get all team members involved. Now, remember here, again, it's easier to tear something up or to try to improve it once it's defined. Our first big step is to get it in written form on the desk, on the table, in front of our fellow team members because that's how, with something tangible, we can start working on and uh, uh, start improving. Uh, number nine, solution agreement. As early as the second task team meeting, the team can make uh, or take actions from step eight, moving to a consensus agreement. Really what we're saying there is that as early as the first meeting, we can start having some consensus agreement on what the problems, what the solutions, what the processes, what the steps are. Okay, and if you look at uh, number 10, it says training solution. It says, once agreement of the solution is re reached, complete item 22 on task team form. And again, what we're looking at is that what we're going to do is that, number one on the training solution we've talked about, one of the worst things we do is that we don't formalize that implementation of that training. So we're going to ask 10.1, name the trainers who will work who will train the solution. Who's the best person to train? The person doing that job. What's he going to train on? They're basically going to train on the written procedure. Okay, and what are we going to use as a training tool or a handout? The written procedure. And what we're asking to do is to put that written procedure up on a flip chart where you can teach the class on that procedure. Then pass out the written procedure and process steps or the system or whatever it is that we're doing at that particular time and they're going to put it in their base work center because remember that affects them. And remember no one in the organization can be held accountable for that procedure until everybody has signed off on it. Because it, uh, we've talked about this for the last several classes is that sending out a memo ain't going to do it and passing around a form to get everybody to sign off on it ain't going to do it. That's why we have to formalize those base work centers. If you look at number 11, it says a trial test uh, measure solution. Sometimes we need to trial test. Now, we're also doing some stuff on statistical process control a little later on and all that. You know, we talked earlier about not making all this stuff so complicated. And this is where I was saying almost 11 years ago, I started like everybody else, brainstorming for problems in these quality circle things because that's how everybody else was doing it. As I told you what happened, we went in there and this particular process had like 14 steps. And so we're in this process and what happened was is that as we got through this thing, we had team members going, let me fix the problem. I know the answer. And I'm going, you can't. We still have five more steps to go to. What we're saying right here is that this trial test or this solution, the chances are we're not going to have to trial test the solution. 
Now, probably every quality guru that's out there is going to say I'm crazy. I'm saying the majority of the problems are not complex problems and we don't need to make them complex. And the one way to step back from them being complex is let the people that are doing it define the process, step, and procedure and let them train it. They know how to do their job. Remember that. They know how to do their job. We've got to give them the tools to support. So if you're looking at the trial, test, and measure solution, well, chances are we don't have to do that. And I'm suggesting probably 99% of the time you ain't got to do that. This measuring and trial testing, we've got so hung up on uh, uh, taping stuff to the walls and in the meeting rooms and writing all this and that. Half of, the majority of our processes and stuff aren't that, aren't that complex. Literally, the written procedure and the training of it will uh, take care of that. But in case, we do have some other things that we can do uh, in a later class, but we're not going to address that here. Number 12 is approval. Do we need to present for approval? Remember, we're saying the majority of the time we don't have to present for approval. Why? Well, everybody in their area of expertise and control is basically going to be involved in it, and very seldom does it have to do with uh, dollar issues. Yeah, well, we need another truck, we need another camera, we need another forklift, we need an extra person, we need, that's our first go at it, is that we want to throw money at it. What we first need to be asking is, why is that thing happening? And really getting down to what we call that root cause. So most of the time, we don't need approval. Everybody in their area of expertise and control of their job can make that solution, and they can, or, uh, and they can approve that. So again, don't worry about that. And then the completion, this thing's completed once the, uh, the training has been implemented and everybody that's involved in that process or step and that procedure and the training has received it and signed off, then it's a deal. But until we go through the formal training and implementation, it's not a deal. Okay, if you look at page number five, Okay, uh, page number five, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, page number five is how to make a good problem statement. Now, you're going to see this again, and you're going to see this in a lot of the classes here on out because the, the things that we're using are processes to address problems. How to make a good pro problem statement is very important, and what we're saying here, we can't fix something that's too big or too enormous for the team to work on. And we have some reference information, reference information in our 1600, but that's in our 1600 modules in our overall ABS program. So that's where that number's coming from, because a lot of you taking our classes are also involved in the other processes. Step one uh, is brainstorming for problem. Matters of direct interest are importance to oneself or team. What are the problems in our base work center? This is also what we talked in a, a class or two ago. These are the steps that we need to refresh our memory as we get into these tasks. Number one, make a good problem statement. A good problem statement is going to suggest a solution. Step one is brainstorm for the matters. Problems, brainstorm for problems for a problem solving group or task team to address are causes of the problems, and we're saying are solutions to the root cause, the real. So as we're brainstorming, remember the skill we talked about learning? We're just throwing up what we think the solution is, and we're brainstorming uh, solutions, or we're brainstorming causes of the problems. There's a lot of things that take by brainstorming just throwing it out there. <laughs> and you're going to find somebody going to come up with something. You're going to look and go, ooh, where'd that come from? You won't believe the talent that's laying uh, basically undiscovered in your organization. Step number two, selection. Which, pr which response will the team work on? And how do we do that? Basically, we prioritize the response selection, and that one is by multi-voting. Again, multi-voting is kind of the way that we go through systematically through a process to get it down to a final. But we also want to remember that consensus agreement. The consensus agreement is really important because consensus agreement is, in effect, negotiating. The consensus agreement is coming to an agreement on a procedure, on a process and step, on training, on implementation, the problem statement. 
These are the skills that we learn through doing, and these are the base skills that no matter where we're at, even at home, uh, most of our spouses, I always lose all my arguments or discussions, as you want to say, so hopefully we can learn some uh, consensus agreement stuff. So if you look at that, that's kind of a little uh, overlook at uh, some things that we need in order to help on that task team. If you'll turn to page six now, step 2A, this is the consensus selection, agree to a response. When multi-voting, as I said earlier, is not an appropriate way, but because we don't want to multi-vote what, what procedure we're going to use, we got to come to a consensus agreement on what that particular procedure or that process is. And that's literally folks putting that deal on the table, talking about it, having something in written form, getting everybody to agree on it. That's consensus agreement. Multi-voting ain't going to do it. It's either right or wrong or that one or that one. We're saying the consensus agreement. And your people can do better once something's written down. And that's why we encourage, even though that's kind of against a lot of the uh, educational and training philosophy. We're saying, let's get something in writing and get it back in front of our people. Instead of stepping back and beating that, that dead horse all day long, we're saying, let's get in there, let's start making it happen. People can react, and they react favorably to something that's tangible. When we're talking in concepts around the room, it's really hard to put it together. And there's always somebody in that team that can put it together. Okay, then step number three on page six, cause and effect. Why is the problem happening? Again, what we're talking about here, our first question of the problem statement is, is there a written procedure? Even before we get into any of this, remember, always ask if there's a written procedure. It just kills me how much time we spend doing all this stuff, and we don't even have a written procedure to start with. And you might, you're, just, you're just chasing that dog around in the yard all day long, and he ain't going to never catch it. We've got to at least put it in a written form, and our first question should be, is there a written procedure? And remember, we have to determine why the problem happened. Generally, the problem falls into the four barriers to quality. Folks, literally, 98% of those issues are going to be in those four barriers somewhere. And so what we're trying to do is give these base skills that everyone in the organization can contribute. And this is a real key process here, is that task team, because you'll see that that plays um, throughout the organization in a lot of different ways. So that's kind of our process and steps of starting that task team. And we'll go over the form, and I'll go over this in just a few minutes. Let's look at page number seven. Now, if some of y'all have been in class, and if y'all have uh, been in our training program for a few years or, or in our classes, you're going to hear problem statement again. Problem statement, no matter what you're doing, no matter what class, whether you're strategic planning, uh, whether you're uh, statistical process, whatever you're doing, you have to have a good problem statement. Here again, for some of y'all, for the, your first look at it, a problem statement or a good task statement. Remember, that thing has to be to where we can get our arms around that thing. We don't want to go, uh, and I hope some of our people aren't listening, uh, <laughs> that we actually had this problem with. They said, hey, we need another forklift driver and a new truck. Once they got into it, we have some experts at that company that work through this huge, enormous, pro oh, it was, we needed another yard, needed to invest another million dollars because we couldn't get our stuff, our equipment and the materials moved around. Once Richard got in there with his expertise in uh, problem solving and task teaming, he was able to get it down to the fact of, well, why? And got it down to where literally they fixed it with just reorganizing the yard and stuff. But our first, our first response is, need a new yard, need a new forklift. I say, until you formalize your organization and your base work centers, you don't need to be hiring nobody else. What are you going to hire them to do? So here, we need to really come into an agreement on this problem statement. And it's key, and it's crucial, and narrow enough. It says, number one up here, it says, enormous, massive statement of a problem. <laughs> 
we can't generalize. And what we're saying here is that here's an example of that. The organization paperwork is so messed up. What's the use? It won't change, states the shipping and receiving manager. Man, now what is that saying? It's saying all the paperwork in every department, everything's messed up. What's the use? He ain't even told us what particular form. And remember, we have a tendency, and we'll talk about these in these classes a little later on, about how to make extreme issues out of everything and make the worst case out of everything. And then when you start sifting through it, it's not really that big of an issue. We just have a tendency to make it that way, out of that habit. The next one is, is that the state the problem narrowly enough so that the team can handle it. And originally, shipping is getting all kinds of sloppy paperwork. Shipping is, in the improved statement, ship, shipping is receiving incorrectly prepared bills of lading. A really improved there. Now let's look at write the problem as a declarative statement, not a question. Well, guys, we want to state it. We don't want to ask. Then it says, be detailed rather than general. Whenever you're saying something in volume or things are all messed up, what is the thing you're talking about? And if it is messing up, how many times is it? Once a month, once a year, once a quarter? Or it just happened to be today to aggravate you, and now you're going to jump, we're going to all jump through hoops on this thing. And it looks at uh, avoid mentioning blame causes or solution. You know, this is, this is really important as we're going through working on this problem statement is that, remember, we're all kind of coming clean. We don't care how in the world it got to however we're doing it because we're saying business, along with the business, the processes evolve and the systems evolve. So we're not going to spend the energy on whipping anybody. All we're going to say is, is that, okay, here's the issue. This is what we got to do, and we're not blaming other departments. Because remember, we need to work with those other departments. And also, too, remember all those things that affect an effective team member stuff that we talked about in our last uh, work, our, our last class with brainstorming. How the four barriers are not only affecting your team, but affecting the problem solving and the stuff that you're doing out in the organization with your task team. Use measurable uh, uh, quantities when possible. Try to get some numbers in there. And then it says the solution, as you'll go back and read this, it's really the written procedure for the bills of lading. You wouldn't believe this. Now, I want y'all, when you go back and somebody starts saying they got a problem, got this, got that, ask them if they have a written procedure. Chances are they don't have it. Now, I also have organizations, they all want to just write procedure. They don't want to work on the fear, don't want to work on the communication, don't want to work on the training. You can't, as we call it, barrier pick. You got to do it all because one is dependent on the other. And if you don't do, you only do three and not one, it's still going to collapse. And we got plenty of certification organizations and programs that are out there that are certifying process, but they're not working on any of the other stuff, much less big skills, much less things to help our people. We have to help our people. Okay, now let's look at on, uh, as on page seven there. Let's look on page eight, and basically what page eight is, is that you'll see this, I believe, in the majority of the classes from here on out. This is called the Individual uh, Team Task Team Base Work Systems Kit. Now, this kit here is, is out of our program and out of our curriculum for this ABS. What we're doing is, these are the forms that we need or the processes in order to put this task team into play and actually start doing some things. So if you look at this, this is where these forms are coming from, is out of the ABS, out of our Base Work Systems 2000, which is where all this curriculum originated from over the last 11 years. Let's look at page number nine. Page number nine is the task team form. Now all you do is go back and look at that for, uh, task team procedure that we talked about earlier and it'll tell you how to fill this thing out. And I'm going to kind of go over it with you because this process is really the backbone of all this. So literally, I am going to sponsor a task team. I get this task team form and I start completing it. I am the sponsor. Remember. Who's the best person to probably be the task team leader? The sponsor is. Why? Because the sponsor probably has an idea of 
what the solution is. Like all our team members, and the majority of our organize, organization know what to do and what, to, and what it's going to take for, to fix that problem. Why don't they? Four barriers to quality. So this task team is a formal process, and if you look at this, we'll just go through this and look at, you put the sponsor's names, the date, the ID number that we'd get from the coordinator if we have one, and if your organization, if you have a training thing, in some later classes, we'll even formalize it more with some task team logs and stuff like that as we're going through the more complex, in a way, uh, like strategic planning and project management, which again, that's not that complex either. We just make it. And then we have the problem statement. Remember we talked about the problem statement. If, if the problem statement is small enough, write it in there. If not, just attach the thing. Then we're going to go intended solution. <laughs> when we're going in there, what is the intended solution? The majority of the time, the intended solution is a written procedure for the problem statement. It's usually our first uh, blush at it. Then we're going to have, we'll put the leader, we'll put the team number, his team number, and their base work center number if they have it. Then our base work center is affected. Remember, who are the best people to help you? fix the deal, the folks that are involved in that process. So what we're going to do here is list those base work centers that touch that process. Remember, by all those base work centers that are, in, that are focused on that particular process, link them together, creates the systems. So what we're going to do here is that we're just going to go through this and we're going to go down here and we're going to list all the base work centers and we're going to take kind of a good representative from each of those base work centers. If we have some that have more than one person, uh, or more than one, uh, might have four or five in a particular base work center. We want to take the best, and remember, we want to keep it between four and seven employees. And out of that, we'll put their team member's name, and then we'll also list, if you see that R out there to the side, the R is for resource, so remember those folks that aren't functioning on the team, we would circle that as a resource person. So now remember, we would go back in there and we would ask, okay, number one for volunteers, but then what we want to do is formalize it, get a team of four to seven people, get our first meeting together, and uh, have the other folks as resource people. Okay, down there at the bottom, this is where all this stuff that they were talking about, uh, or they were, we were talking about earlier in our process and steps. So we're saying go back and look at that and put, set the form down. All right, so now let's step back. Where are we at in the process? Number one, I get a, again, I get the form. I start filling out the top, start getting the team together. And then I, if I forget, I can go back a couple of pages and look at the process and steps of filling this form out, the task team process and steps. And look down at the bottom, it says, uh, not at the bottom, but under the lines there, the members, it says projected finish date. We want to say, when is the projected uh, finish date? We want to start that. We don't want this thing to go on until my retirement comes up. We want to put a date and end this thing. And if you look at the acknowledgement, what we're asking there for the acknowledgement is for that sponsor, their boss, or their facilitator, manager, or whatever is acknowledging that they're working on a task team. Because remember, when we have fear and the four barriers in there, uh, sometimes we get some guys a little bent out of shape when we start looking at solving problems internally in the organization, and that mainly has to do uh, with the fear. So now let's look at down at the, at the bottom, it says number six. Do team members involved in the items below need to review the problem statement, task and our intended solution for clarity? What I would do is that, I'd, I'd check yes. I would, as the sponsor or the team leader, I would come in and say, okay, here's our problem statement. What do y'all think? The advantage of having three to four to five to seven people max on your task team, they get a whole different look at it and sometimes we always try to find these smart ones that can read and write real good and make good statements. We get those folks to help us out. We can kind of lay it out, and then they come in and make and help improve and clarify that problem statement. So, yeah, you probably do. Number seven here is where we were talking about the scheduling of the meetings. 
okay, let's just say, I'm just going to say meeting one's in January, and we want to finish out in March meeting four. Then we want to pick a date somewhere there in the middle and then agree in that first meeting you at least two or three meetings out to accomplish that task. Because again, remember in a lot of our organizations, especially up front, we don't have the discipline. The discipline is not internally within the organization, so we need to plan it as far as ahead as we can and get everybody there to sign off on it. Okay, next is, is this, is this a base work center process and step? Now, what do you think? Chances are, yes, it is a process and step, and would there be a procedure needed? Yes. All right, now remember, what are we talking about? A system. What are systems? Systems are the way we basically do everything in the organization. So if you look at that, the, probably the problem statement we're looking at is some kind of a, a system, like say a, uh, a order request uh, class we've had already. That's a system. So out of that, is there a process and step? I guarantee you there is. And is there a written procedure for that process and step? Now remember, written procedure is just like brain, or uh, written, I'm sorry, not written procedure. Process and step is just like flow charting or process mapping or whatever else they're, they're calling it now. Okay, number nine, are there forms involved in this task team? Yes or no? C form summary. Why are we collecting the forms? Why are we collecting the paperwork? Remember, the paperwork is going to suggest a system. Remember, that's why we have to get all the paperwork that's involved in that particular, because it's really going to help line us out on what we're going to do. And after four or five years of college, uh, I still didn't realize that until after I got out there and started squirming around in some of these companies, the paperwork's going to suggest a system. It's going to be a heck of a good start because the other thing that we need to do, like I said, we need to write a form procedure too because the majority of the paperwork and stuff we got don't have any procedure to it. Not only procedure, there's no process connected to it. So that in itself is going to clear up a lot of stuff. <laughs> Can you imagine how much paperwork you got? And forms, it's absolutely amazing. And then it says, uh, are, are there action items? Yeah, usually there is action items. Remember back uh, in the process and steps we talked about is assigning out. Let's say we get somebody to define the process and the steps. We get someone to start drafting procedures. In fact, there's a process and step, maybe 20 steps. And out of that, what we will do is that what we'll do is take that, basically, and we will then uh, get assigned it out in an action item. And this action item form is, uh, is a couple of forms back, but we're noting here that there are action items. This is how we can manage it. Then it says, uh, number 11, complete training and implementation form. Okay, implementation form's a little further back in this pack. We're going, do we have an implementation? We can probably get somebody now to start doing that. Then it says, number 12 on page 9, do we need to trial test or measure the solution? <laughs> I'm saying the majority of the time, no. And the uh, quality boys and a lot of other folks are going to be arguing with that, but I don't think we need to make it more complex than what we're, we do already. And remember, the majority of us, I'd say 97%, aren't trying to get a rocket to the moon. We're just trying to resolve some issues in our immediate uh, base work center. Do we need to present for approval? Most of the time, no, because we got everybody focusing in their area. So that's the base work center task team form. This is the form that starts it all out. The coordinator, the sponsor, the, uh, the steering committee, the trainer, or whoever's in charge of this thing basically is managing however many task teams that the organization has. So if you look at the task team form, is really the, a process within itself that's really telling us how to manage, plan, schedule, and monitor this particular task team. Let's look at page number 10, the problem statement. The problem statement is, this is the blank form that we will write the stuff on. This is what we've been talking about, and we had that a little earlier. Let's look at page number 11. 
Page number 11 is action item quick action. Now, why it says action item quick action, you know, sometimes we get these, and I don't really want to get into it that much. That's our, uh, um, we, you remember earlier we said five problem solving processes. Process uh, D is the, uh, is basically the uh, quick, quick action. And this is the same form that we do. A quick action is something we can agree on. Like, uh, I need to comb my hair before I come do this show or something like that. That's a quick action. That's a quick success. We can do that and that deal's done. But this is that formal process. Instead of running out there and say you're going to do something. Page number 12 is the summer, uh, uh, summary of forms and paperwork, data screen entry, and, that, and so on and so on. What we're saying there is that we want to collect all that stuff. And when we're saying the data screens or the data entry, just get the first screen and uh, print it off on a letter size and attach it to here. Because that's going to tell you the process or the program or the downloading or the collection or whatever it is that we're going to have to do. Okay, next let's look at uh, page number 13. Page number 13 is the form procedure. Now the form procedure is a little different. What we do is just basically, like in our task team thing, or a form that we're working on, we'd just list the items in the blanks, and we'd list those item numbers on the side, and then we'd write what fills into that blank. Now when we're in our uh, two-year training program, one of the first things that we do is do form procedure, because in a very simple, confined fashion, it teaches us to write process, step, and procedure in a form. So it, it's a good way to get started. Let's look on page 14. Page 14 is our process and step form. Now this is just like flow charting. This is just like process mapping. This is just like what we've been talking about. This is the formalized form that we're going to use to do this thing. So if you look at this, the process and step is just that written form to do that. There's a uh, front, and, front and back page of that. Number 16. This is what we want to use here is the base work center procedures thought process worksheet. This is to help us organize our thoughts when we're writing procedures. And the reason I ended up doing this several years ago is that because we'd start writing procedure, somebody would go out and come back in and they'd have a nice job, but somebody would go, what about this? Go, oh, I forgot that. Somebody would go, what about that? Oop, I forgot that. So this is a good little uh, thought process to organize our thoughts for that particular procedure that we're working on. And then let's look at page number 17. Page number 17 is the base work center uh, procedures form. Remember, for each of the process and steps, there's also a, a written procedure for that. Okay, so this is what that written procedure, and you'll see uh, up there it says reference step number. You just put the step number of that process and step, and that'll tell you where the procedure is. Okay, and that's a front and back form. And then let's look at page 19. That's our training and implementation. That's the formal process to make sure that deal's getting trained and who's doing it and a completion date to where we can get sign off. So that's all the forms that you're going to need in order to work this process and step deal uh, and our task team. If you'll look at now, let's look on page 20, frequently asked questions and our thoughts. Okay, and we talked about this first one a little while in our uh, class previous to this. Also in this class here, uh, item number one, what are the three W's? What are our problems? Which problem we work on? And why is the problem happening? Okay, that's the three W's. And that's in like the brainstorming, uh, selection, and asking why. Okay, the cause and the effect. That's what those three are. And that was kind of, we got that in that uh, simple format of our problem solving uh, class that we had that, that also accomplishes a lot of things to work as a team and to get uh, the procedures down. Uh, also number two, who can sponsor a task team? When we go into an organization as we go, anyone in the organization can sponsor a task team. We're saying if they got a problem, they can do it. What do you mean by training implementation? We're saying that a training and implementation form is the form we just looked at a minute ago that 
until we have that form done, till people have been trained, till they've received the procedure, we're saying that procedure cannot be held accountable. It is unfair to the organization. Dictating procedure by memo is history. It's not going to work our email nowadays because <laughs> we know where that'll be. That'll be done for about three minutes and then something else will come along. Why is the problem statement so important? The problem statement is so important because it really gives focus to the team and tries to clarify what we're talking about. And what we're saying here by clarifying it down to what the real uh, problem statement is usually will suggest a solution, will usually tell us what we got to do. And then it says, what is a consensus agreement? Now, a consensus agreement is just kind of like negotiating. Remember, we had talked before about uh, multi-voting. Well, multi-voting works good when you got some either got to pick or choose or something. A consensus agreement is getting those teams and getting them team skills, that task team or whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're at home or whether we're, we're coming to a consensus agreement, not like multi-voting. A consensus agreement is really negotiation between team members or between families to come to a, a consensus agreement instead of me pushing in there and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. We had enough of all that mess over these last 30 or 40 years. We got to get a consensus agreement. Does everything have to be written? <laughs> it was interesting. We're saying we don't have time to write it, but we sure got time to do it again, ain't we? And we're saying here in one of our uh, board meetings, one of the first ones, seven or eight or ten years ago, something like that, one of the first things they said was that the, uh, one of the, the board members said, well, Bruce, it sounds like really what we ought to do, every problem that we have, we need to write it down. I go, it'll end up being written as a procedure, yes. There's not one that we haven't yet. I don't have time to do it now, but you will have to make time to do it again. Guys, I know a lot of this stuff is just making it happen and the discipline and the habit. And it's also, too, when problem solving and formalizing is not accepted in an organization, sometimes people get the negative rap if we have somebody in there that's doing that. And in every company I've ever had, uh, we always have somebody that say we're going to lose every customer known to man that we ever had because we got to write it down. Uh, I think Mike Smith and I actually put a clock on it. It takes like, like six seconds longer to complete a form correct. It's something ridiculous. How does, how does doing it again affect our day and our coworkers and our customers? Who? You say you ain't got enough time? How? I want you to step back and go back and look at how many things that you're doing that have already been done or somebody else's tragedy that's now dumped on you. I think that'd free up some time. What do you mean by one minute to manage plan schedule and man, manage plan schedule and monitor turns into be one hour to fix? We don't put the effort into it, it'll come back to bite us. Why take the time to formalize? It seems a lot of wasted time. <laughs> It's habit. If you don't formalize, you're just wasting what time you're doing either, talking about it or trying. All base work centers involved to improve. Everyone that's involved in it needs to improve that system. Can we use those base work skills, at, base skills at home? Yeah, we can. Look at everything we're talking about. We're learning some skills here that we can not only use in department but in the organization. That's our class for today. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing it at our next class, and have, have a good day.